And welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Skin cancers are on the increase in the United States. The two most common causes, basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer. Usually in sun exposed areas, that means the face. Current surgery can allow less disfiguration, smaller lesions, and 99% cure rate. We'll be spending most of this show talking about the treatment of skin cancers with surgery, how it's done, and how safe and how effective it is. My guest is Dr. Katherine Kirshner. Dr. Kirshner is a board certified dermatologist, and she's been trained in a special type of surgery to give the best results. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on The Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about migraine headaches and what I can do for them and stress management. Do you have stress in your life? Most people do. We'll give some tips on how to handle stress. We're talking with Dr. Katie Kirshner, board certified dermatologist, skin specialist, and we're talking about skin cancers and their treatment. Katie, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me. Tell me about skin cancers. Are they more and more prevalent? They are there. You know, skin cancer is the most common type of cancer in the United States currently. Is it on the increase or more and more? Do you think we're seeing yeah, more and more? Yeah, definitely, definitely seeing more. We certainly have, you know, more of an elderly population around, so certainly we're seeing a lot more in terms of numbers. The two most common causes of skin cancer, mm -hmm. the, no, two common types yes. would be what? Squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. Squamous cell mm -hmm. and basal cell. Correct. Let's talk about basal cell first. Mm -hmm. What's a basal cell cancer? What's it look like and where is it located? Okay, so a basal cell carcinoma is typically something that's going to be in a sun distributed area, meaning something that gets sunshine on it. So your head, you know, top of your head, your ears, face, um, chest, shoulders. Um, typically looks like a shiny or a pearly bump on the skin. So it's often hard to spot um, for some people. Um, they can get red and scaly. And one thing that I tend to hear a lot um, from patients is that it's a bump that just doesn't want to heal and it's bleeding. Now, if you've got a little shiny bump, mm -hmm. Uh, when they say it doesn't heal, mm -hmm. uh, I think of a, an open lesion, one that's mm -hmm. open and raw looking. Are they open and raw looking? They can be, but they aren't always. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually would they just be a small bump? It, does it get bigger? It usually does, yes. And when it gets bigger, then somebody that's gets the, nervous? That's correct. Uh, could it be something else, a cyst? It or? could be lots of different things, and that's why you go see your dermatologist to have them look at it. So. Mm -hmm. When you see a lump on the face or the ear, mm -hmm. can you pretty well tell, uh-oh, that's going to be a skin cancer? Usually, yeah. But there are definitely cases where, you know, even us looking at them with a trained eye say, you know, this looks like a cancer, but it could be just an inflamed cyst. And so we do a biopsy to figure it out at that point. If I had a basal cell mm -hmm. cancer on my cheek, mm -hmm. which is exposed to the sun, what would it feel like to you? What do, what do you... What do you, when you feel, what are you, what are you looking for? Well, it's a raised area, and, and it often is, like you were saying, you know, not healing and open sore. Um, but sometimes they don't hurt at all. There are lots of people who have no idea that they have them, um, and that's why we stress the importance of skin screenings. And skin screening means? Come to see your dermatologist to have them look at you head to toe. Mm -hmm. Any certain age you should come for skin screening? You know, we're exposed to sun all our life. We're, right. We try and use sunscreens mm -hmm. now. When I grew up, you didn't use sunscreens. Correct. And so the people who have higher risk, those who have not used a lot of sunscreen in their life, people who work outdoors, those are the people we really need to get in. Um, and certainly by age 40, you should start coming in to be looked at at least as an initial visit. And sometimes earlier, depending on your risk factors. If somebody has a little P-shaped shiny bump mm -hmm. on their cheek mm -hmm. or on the top of the ear, uh, the treatment of choice would be surgery? 
Sometimes. It just depends on what it is. We have to find out first that it is a basal cell carcinoma. So how do you find out if it's basal cell? So a biopsy is performed first. And a biopsy sounds scary, um, yeah. but it actually is not too big of a deal. Um, in the office, we use local anesthesia, which means numbing with a needle. Okay. Um, that's performed pretty gently, actually, um, and very quickly. It works immediately. And then we use a flexible blade to basically remove just the sup you know, superficial kind of top part of the lesion um, to basically sample it and see what it is under the microscope. And then under the microscope, you can tell if it's a cancer, what Correct. type of cancer, and, and start having your plan for mm -hmm. that. Yes. Um, squamous cell mm -hmm. cancer, what's it look like? So it can be um, various different forms as well, but often they are red, scaly, they can be painful, um, and they often grow more quickly than basal cell carcinoma. Basal cells are very slow growing, whereas squamous cell is typically very quick um, in terms of its growth. What, is, what does quick mean? If I had a lesion that was a uh, pinpoint mm -hmm. that was going to be squamous cell on my cheek again. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm really doing a lot of damage to my cheek here. If it was that size, yeah. how long before it would be the size of an eraser or the size of a quarter? It, it could be very rapid. Um, it's dependent, of course, on the tumor characteristics. Those that are more aggressive can grow very, very rapidly. I've seen something go from the size of a pin to the you know size of your entire nostril um, in just a matter of weeks. And so it just depends on the tumor. Same location as the basal cell? The it head, be, the face, it, yes, the sun exposed areas? Yes, often is, but there can be other areas that can be involved, um, certainly mucosal skin. Um, like inside skin? the lip um, uh -huh. or also in the anogenital region. So mm -hmm. you, cancer can be almost anywhere, is that? It can. Mm -hmm. um, the treatment for squamous cell cancer? Mm -hmm. um, various different treatments as well. Um, of course, um, excision is one, uh, but you can also perform, if it's a superficial squamous cell carcinoma, you can do what's called a scrape and burn. Um, or electrodesiccation and curatage is oh. the fancy word for scrape and burn. Uh, electrodesiccation. <laughs> and curatage. And yes. curatage. Oh. <laughs> it's very fancy. That's great. Yes. Uh, Katie, you're trained into a special type of mm -hmm. skin cancer surgery. What's that called? Mohs micrographic surgery. Mohs micrograph. How do you spell Mohs? M O H S. And Mohs mm -hmm. is the M O H S for. Each one of those for something, or is it named after? It's named after the physician who invented it, um, Frederick Mose. He was the one who developed it back in the 1930s. So it's been around for a long time. A long time, With yes. improvements? Definite, definite refinements along the way. Um, but in the current form, we now call it Mose micrographic surgery, yes. Is the Mose micrographic surgery the treatment of choice for a significant basal cell or squamous cell cancer? Certainly of the head and neck, for sure. And if it's on the body, there have to be certain criteria that are met. They have to be very large, very aggressive, recurrent tumors typically. Um, but typically the head and neck, hands and feet, um, those are areas that you would tend to see Mohs being performed. Now, the basics, very briefly on Mohs surgery, mm -hmm. what do you do with Mohs surgery that's different from just Cutting around the lesion and taking it out. Sure, so I have a little graphic, if that would be okay, to explain uh -huh. it to you. Um, so with a standard excision, um, say that this black circle represents the cancer, okay? And with the standard excision, you have to take a margin of safety, okay? Sometimes, you know, three to five millimeters, depending on the cancer type and location. And this means three to five millimeters in this direction and this direction and this direction all the way around, okay? So if that's on your nose, is that, that could a, be large. Is that a guess on how wide to make that also? It is a guess, it is, yes. Okay. It's an estimation and it's what's it's been found in studies to give you the highest cure rate with the least amount taken in a standard excision. So that's a standard excision. A standard so keep, excision. Keep going. And so when you remove something with a standard excision, you typically do it in an ellipse form, and that's just to allow for the wound to lie flat and not have that lumpy, bumpy look. Okay, so the, the extra pieces on each end are more for cosmesis. But um, this is removed, and then it's sent off to a pathology lab. Okay, and when it goes to a pathology lab, the thing that is done differently is that it's sliced like a loaf of bread when it arrives to the pathology lab, okay? So sort of like this, okay? 
And so what they're doing is that they are actually looking at the margins, okay? Wherever each of these slices are, this is where they're actually evaluating it under the microscope, okay? Now, in this instance, we've got a clear margin, okay? Because the cancer here is not touching these, okay? But say that you have a cancer that has little roots, as uh -oh. cancers often do, and it happens to be between where the sampling is done. So it looks to me like maybe you, on this one, you took a sample, missed it. Right. Sample missed it, and it's already spread, and you may right. not catch it. You, you may, may not, not know it. it until it recurs. Right. So then it would recur, if you took that out, sewed mm -hmm. it up, thought you got it, mm -hmm. uh, would you have any way of knowing when you look at the, um, the final excision, mm -hmm. when you take out the bull tumor, will it say, uh-oh, you really missed something, no. you need to go back in? No, it's all microscopic. So you really, you mm -hmm. really don't know. So don't know. the Mohs surgery, that's standard, that's not Mohs. This is a standard excision, not Mohs, correct. And the Mohs is going to be different than this type of surgery. Correct. So we, with Mohs micrographic surgery, we use frozen sections while the patient is waiting. And the theory of it is that we take here, the black again is cancer, but we take a very, very small margin, okay? The intention is to spare healthy tissue uh -huh. um, so that we can maximize your function as well as your cosmesis. Because this is typically, again, in areas where you want to make sure things look normal, like your head and neck. And so we do a small margin, but we can get away with the small margin because we are actually going to evaluate 100% of the margin under the microscope because it's processed completely differently. The bread loafing is not performed. All of the edges are pressed down onto the microscope slide and the entire base. And so in theory, 100% of the margin is being evaluated. Are you doing this while the patient is having the surgery done? So the surgery is performed by me the tumor is removed, here's your piece, and then we have the patient wait with a bandage while the tissue is being processed in our lab, okay? And while the patient is waiting, uh -huh. you're gonna be getting more information. We're gonna talk about that when we come back. What information is being received while this is gone to the pathologist while the patient is still under the operating table or procedure? Wanna stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Katie Kirchner, board certified dermatologist. We're talking about skin cancers. We've talked about basal cell, a little shiny bump. We've talked about squamous cell, sometimes a little meaner looking raw, one that gets bigger fast, whereas the basal cell grows slowly. We've talked about incisions to remove them. You can have a, a removal and sew it up, but you really don't know if you've gotten everything. And now we're talking about Mohs surgery. Katie, tell me, what was your training in Mohs surgery? How long does it take for a person to be trained in this? So, of course, you have to complete a dermatology residency, um, which, you know, complete residency, including internship, is four years. And then the surgical um, Mohs micrographic surgery fellowship is an additional year. Um, and that is done, it's approved by the American College of Mohs Surgery. So we're back to this lesion mm -hmm. here. We've taken off a slice or what we think is the surface there. And then it, then what do you do? Do you do the staining? Do you look at it under microscope? We have to send it off to the pathologist. So we have a lab in our um, office. Um, it is an outpatient procedure. And as soon as the tumor is removed from the patient, this piece is actually taken right back to our lab, which is right around the corner. Um, and we have fabulous histotechnicians who then take the piece itself, they bisect it. And I brought um, some papers to kind of explain it if you want me uh -huh. to show you this. Um, we'll use this as an example. Um, we call stage one the first layer um, that we're removing. And we remove it almost in a saucerization, which I'll explain here. I brought an orange um, to explain we're it. We're gonna talk about that orange yes. in just a minute. <laughs> I'm sure you were wondering why I brought it. So anyhow, we remove um, the cancer, and it's typically in the shape of a circle, but it's really just surrounding the tumor itself and the shape that the tumor is mm -hmm. in. And in this case, it happens to be a circle. So we remove it in the shape of a circle, but before I do that, I make marks like a clock face on it. And it extends from the patient onto the part that I'm going to remove. So this double hash score, that's the 12 o'clock score, okay? 
three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, okay? So it's removed just like that, okay? And I'll show you on the orange how that is done. Yeah, let's pretend like this orange is my face. Right. And we've got a lesion. Right. And you're gonna do, you've, oh, so you've got the, I've you've got, got it, it marked off yep. there. And so this is uh -huh. the what will be first stage, okay? Uh -huh. And you can see the double hash mark there at the top, okay? Right about there, that is our 12 o'clock score, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, okay? So you make a slice? Right, because our cancer's here in the center, okay? And so we, this would actually be a much narrower margin, but for the purposes of discussing it with you, I made it larger. So this is actually removed, and i just show you. We've got a little handy scalpel here. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so it is removed, we go all the way around, okay? And then we pick it up with our forceps here, and we think, oh, we've got it, because you can't tell microscopically if it's there or not. But I did dye it purple, okay, uh -huh. to represent where tumor might still be, okay? And you can look at the underside of the orange here to see where the cancer actually still is, okay? Yeah, you stain that. So you I just help. stain that to explain it to you, but you can't normally see that under normal circumstances. It just looks like normal tissue, okay? So that's removed. I then take the tissue to the lab. It is frozen. It's cut on a special machine called a cryostat into micron thin pieces. They're very, very thin. Goes onto microscope slides. Those slides are then stained and then I evaluate them under the microscope. What are you looking for? I'm looking for those cancer cells. They look totally different than normal tissue. And when you find the cancer cells, mm -hmm. Uh, how do you decide if you've made a big enough lesion on my cheek that had this cancer Right, there? right. So if we see it, it's at the true margin. Um, and we, you know, make certain numbers of cuts in to know how far we are in margin-wise. But if it's there, it is at the true margin. And so I'm able to mark that because I can see those hash marks uh -huh. under the microscope. And I can say, oh, we've got some cancer here between, you know, in this case, it was 9 and 12 o'clock and 3 and 6 o'clock. And so that's what the red represents, is the cancer that we saw under the microscope. So if there's some cancer that's left there, what do you have to do We then? have to take more, okay? So got same amount? Well, we, we want to, of course, stay limited to only where the cancer is, right? Ah, so you're going to, then you don't have to focus. worry about two right. and three here, we, just one and four. You got it. So you go a little bit deeper we, in those. And, and wider because this was so close to the skin edge in this particular case, okay? So we went ahead and we took a second stage here. Here's our 12 o'clock again, uh -huh. okay? And we're gonna go ahead and take more and take more. Uh, this is just super the, speedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll remove our piece, which is much deeper than it normally would be because of sure, the orange. <laughs> sure, sure. And then we look at it under the microscope and we're found to have a nice, healthy, clean margin. Okay? So, and that's what you're looking by, clean, healthy mm -hmm. margin, mm -hmm. you mean? No cancer. And there's no cancer around there. You've gone through the whole thing. Correct. Whereas before, you can have an educated guess. Correct. But here, you're looking at it under the microscope. What's the uh, cure rate? It's up to 99%. It's the best cure rate that exists for a skin cancer. So there's, to me, wow, yeah. no, no other way basically to do it other Well, other there are other ways, but certainly when it's the head and neck um, in sensitive cosmetic areas where you don't want to lose a lot of tissue, I think this is absolutely the method of choice. How long does this take? Well, it depends. Um, if we clear you, you know, with a single stage, um, you can often be finished within a few hours. Um, mm -hmm. It's certainly not immediate. It is definitely slower than a standard excision, which would just involve cutting it and sewing it up immediately, which is, you know, at the most an hour. But this has to also account for the processing time, okay? So with a standard excision, you have to wait several days to get your results. And so you may cut it out and get a call three or four days later saying, oh, oh. sorry, we still have a positive margin. You have to come back and we have to cut it out again. So in a Mohs, you don't have to do that. Correct. While the person's on the table, yep. you know where you are mm -hmm. until you get free of cancer Correct. cells. Correct. Uh, and that may take several hours mm -hmm. to do that during yep. the day. Mm -hmm. And then when you've removed it all, mm -hmm. then you sew it up just like you sew up Typically. a regular wound? Typically we do sew it up, um, though there are areas that we don't have to. Some areas can do what's called granulating, which means healing on its own. But typically we use a lot of stitches. And that can be a side-to-side -side primary closure, but we also perform flaps um, and grafts, which are more complex closures. Wow. But that's also part of my training and my fellowship. And it really is sophisticated mm -hmm. training done yeah. only should only be done by people who are trained in this. Well, it certainly is a helpful <laughs> thing. <laughs> From my yes. standpoint, that's what it should be. Yeah. Um, 
What do you advise somebody who's had Mohs surgery for skin cancer? Uh, are there chances of getting, are there chances of this recurring very significant? You very said, small, yeah. less than 1%. So what do you tell the person to do? They've had one skin cancer, so what they, do you tell them? They need to wear sunscreen, high number SPF, broad spectrum, absolutely. I always say at least a 50 um, and higher. The technology with sunscreen these days is so good that the higher numbers really are better. And so I encourage them to wear them. Um, a broad brimmed hat, one that has a brim that goes all the way around to protect that head. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <It's> very important. <laughs> well, um, how often should they have a skin check? By a Once you've had the skin cancer right. and it's been, you've had to have most surgery, mm -hmm. how often should that patient come back for looking for other lesions? I typically bring them back on a six month basis at first um, and to make sure they're not going to make a lot of more. If they you know, really stay pretty stable over a few visits, we'll stretch them out to a year. To a year. Mm -hmm. um, Katie Kirshner, you're a wonderful teacher. The, Thank you. the Mohs surgery, <laughs> the significance of it is while they're in the office there, you've got the entire tumor and you don't have to worry about yep. missing some edges or mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. It must be great to, uh, come to a physician like you and when they walk out say, my cancer's gone. It feels good, I think, for patients and it feels good for myself and my staff. I bet it really does. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. You You're a great me. teacher. I hope you'll come back with us again. Absolutely. Thank you. Great show. Mohs Surgery, M-O-H-S. If you've got skin cancer, that's the way it should be removed. Now you're going to want to stay tuned. We'll be talking about migraine headaches and if we have time, stress management. Got any stress in your life? Everybody does. We may talk about that first. I want to thank Dr. Katie Kirshner. Wonderful discussion on Mohs micrographic surgery. Now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Dr. Bob, I have migraine headaches. Can you help me? Well, let's talk about migraine headaches. You need to be sure that the diagnosis is correct. Migraine headaches are vascular headaches. That's blood vessel headaches. They're usually on one side. They don't have to be. They're usually pounding. If untreated, they last about 72 hours. Usually sound bothers those headaches. Usually bright lights bother those headaches. Usually you want to be still and you want to be dark when you've got a migraine headache. Now there are triggers of migraine headaches that we need to know about. It can be lack of sleep, lack of nutrition, a change in work time. It can be stress. It can be hormonal. You need to keep a diary with your headaches so that you can tell what seems to be the trigger. And when migraines occur, when they first start, sometimes you get a pre-drome. Right before the headache occurs, you can take simple aspirin or Tylenol, sometimes relieve the pain. If the headache really gets there, it can be, re be relieved by what we call triptan agonist. You can take those during the headaches and get the headache to go away. How can we prevent? Well, you need to avoid the triggers. And number two, sometimes beta blockers or calcium channel blockers you can take by mouth that decreases the frequency or the incidence of migraine headaches. If you've got migraine headaches, discuss them with your doctor. They can be treated and you may need to see a specialist. Question number two, Dr. Bob, how can I handle stress? Yeah, it's a cute question. Everybody has stress, you know? There's good stress and there's bad stress. If I get stressed out because I'm gonna to have to take a test, it can really help me. It helps me study, it helps me perform. If I have stress before I play a sporting event, it may be good because it may get where I perform better. Or that same stress could be Maybe the stress I didn't know how to handle so I did, couldn't perform on a test or couldn't perform in a sporting event. There may be stress that bothers the body. Um, uh, can't pay my bills, uh, argument with the family, a sick person in the childhood. Those put stress on the body and the body to handle that stress puts out adrenal hormones. The adrenal hormones can then cause elevated blood pressure. They can make you nervous. They can make you where you don't sleep well. So what can we do? to handle stress. Number one, you need to identify what that stress is. That's probably the most important thing. What is the cause of my stress? You may have to sit down and write it down on a piece of paper. What are the triggers of my stress? How can I avoid those triggers? And then some things that 
that to handle the stress to get it to go away or to allow you to function better. Number one, relaxing. <sighs> Take a deep breath and just let that breath out. Maybe participate in yoga. Maybe read about soft flowing things in Mother Nature. Uh, take time for yourself. Listen to soft music. It doesn't take a lot of time to take time for yourself, but be sure you're doing that adequately. Be sure you're eating properly. Be sure you're getting enough sleep. Be sure that you address the stress that you have there so that you can hope that hopefully you can get rid of it. You'll be a lot healthier if you know how to handle stress. If you don't do a good job of handling that stress, it will come out in other things as headaches or high blood pressure. You'll end over wanting to talk that over with your doctor. That's all the time that we have for this show. Remember, those four things we like to do. Exercise. Exercise almost helps everything. It certainly helps stress. It helps uh, us lose weight. It helps reduce our blood pressure. Start the day off eating properly, fruit and fiber. Put a lot of fruit out on the table. Start eating two fruits with your lunch and your supper before you eat anything else. Get eight hours of sleep. If you're not sleeping well, you're not going to perform well. And most of all, what is it we like in the Dr. Bob show? It's that laughter in your life. When you see somebody laugh and giggle, you know that they're going to be a happier and healthier person. So remember, find that person, giggle, tell funny stories, laugh a lot. Watch the people around you be happier. Watch you be healthier and happier.